uh, night navigation uh, exercise where uh, he took off in a group, I think it was 10 or 12 other aircraft that they were spaced uh, apart, so one was not directly in sight of the other, it was night time anyway, and they took off from Point Cook with the intention of flying a night nav course um, by Cressy to Ballarat, to Bacchus Marsh, which was Waypoint, uh, and then back to uh, Werribee, to uh, Point Cook, sorry, not Werribee. What happened? They're still, of course, not sure, but um, the assumptions were that he'd either misread the instruction as far as the wind, strength and direction went, or he had set his course to Creswick instead of Cressy. And if you look at the map, you'll see the difference there. Cress Cressy's there, Creswick's there. Now, had he gone there, and I plotted this out again with a colleague, and uh, took then his, his flight instructions, we plotted it out to um, Cressy, uh, sorry, to, to Creswick. I'll try and make this simple so you can understand. If he had flown um, Cressy, Ballarat, he took Creswick to um, Castlemaine, same distance, same bearing almost. So what had happened is, and remember this is right, <coughs> and the towns weren't as well lit up as they would be now. So he flew there and marked his uh, location, thought he might have been a bit off course. Then set a course for what he thought was Ballarat when he was actually heading to Castlemaine. Overshot Castlemaine and went on a little bit towards Harcourt, realised that he'd made a mistake, looped back, and that is what we call a course made good. Uh, picked up his bearing then from there and set the course for Bacchus Marsh. He called in to uh, Melbourne Tower and reported his position as a beam Bacchus Marsh. They cleared him to uh, Point Cook. Uh, he was flying above cloud, low, low cloud, but uh, not, nothing to really um, trouble him at that stage. He had been cloud out there on the run anyway. Um, let down into the cloud and disappeared. It took 13 months before his uh, remains were found uh, along with the aircraft and of course it was on the mountain. So uh, it was just a case of he had ticked all of the boxes, done all of the, the headings and everything else were quite correct except that first start point was not. Uh, the inquiry again and I, I don't question uh, the uh, results of the court of inquiry but um, it's a case of the only person that really knows what happened is not here to answer for you. So uh, we accept that and we accept the rulings of the court. Um, as a result of that though, they quickly curtailed that type of um, um, night flying for uh, training pilots and insisted on a full review of every flight plan before the guy left the room to go to his aircraft to make sure that he had the correct information down there. There was just one other thing, there was a few I guess that the compass, compass wasn't all it should be, but in the old days you see uh, photographs of these um, fighter aircraft with a compass sitting between the pilot's legs, usually, sitting there, with a horizontal car on it. So the compass is in, in a, a horizontal position. And that was fine, except for uh, the effect of when you had the amount of aircraft that we had at that time, a lot of them parked out in the open. With the direct sunlight down on the compass, it wasn't uh, covered, 
and it affected the luminescence of the compass. So when he was airborne and then went down to look for his heading, the luminescence had gone, so he had then to rely on a handheld torch to uh, check his compass bearings. Um, and that again, he did a magnificent job as far as I'm concerned. We still don't know what caused that initial uh, deviation. Of course, it was a long time ago. And uh, what's done is done. Okay. The other thing that I'd like to just point out to you is how ordinary these guys were. Uh, and I'll try and go off memory. Ralph Erskine, plumber. Uh, Ken Woods, electrical salesman. The sort of guy that you could see at Harvey Norman, perhaps. Uh, and as you can see, quite a charismatic sort of guy. Uh, Philip West, Clark. Uh, Roy Hall. He's one of these names. Uh, an apprentice butcher. Eludes me now, but I think he was in the. Oh yeah, he was a munitions inspector at the uh, at the factory at the uh, munitions factory at Pierre Park. Who else have we got? And of course, Terry Hellman, an apprenticeship electrician. So in other words, these are very ordinary people in many respects. Tradies, a lot of them. Apprentices. They were very young uh, and dead. But you've got that legacy, and uh, don't ever lose it, particularly the people uh, who live in this area. Uh, just keep that in mind that you know, these people uh, didn't die in vain, and uh, they were out there more or less to uh, uh, set an example. They put their hands up, and they could have easily copped out. Norm Greasley could have said, I've got an injured foot. I'll be happy to stick and play in your band. As soon as you got the band in you straight away, that's not where I want to be. And I know that. They had the determination to say, no, this is what I want to do. And when they say that, uh, of, of people, that they served their country, these people well and truly did. They signed that piece of paper and they lived up to their work. Sorry, I've got deathly silence. <laughs> Just one more thing and then I'll go, seriously. And that was the emotional side of, of doing this. I got used to, you don't get used to, the silence on the line when I spoke to a friend or a relative. And the line just went quiet. And then they come back and say, I didn't know that. And you could tell that. It's an emotional time too for the person who's doing the interview because you've got to be able to uh, cop that. And I didn't see, you know, when you look at this, I think uh, Trevor nailed it one day when he said, um, we went out there to find the remains of crashed planes. Curiosity, call it what you like. But we ended up becoming involved. Uh, with situations, friends and relatives, where uh, we were able to uh, offer some comfort uh, to those people. And in fact, the names that come off the top of my head, like Hall, Tout, Batten, these people were also affected by it in one way or another because they witnessed things that you wouldn't expect a person to witness. Uh, in, in normal life. Uh, where we were at Blair's hut, um, Alf Blair it was another uh, well-known identity in the, in the Whittlesea uh, area who figured prominently in these things. He was a bushman, he wasn't cut out for this sort of stuff, but yet he did uh, see the uh, result of these uh, crashes and did what he did, what he could uh, to help. So, 
think I'm probably just about wrapped it. I want to thank everybody for coming up today, and I can't let this go. Karen, you've done a magnificent job. I've looked at the files, I've looked at the photos, and I just take my hat off to you. you you've done a fantastic job. This is a lot of research. I know, because I've done a bit of that myself, but uh, what uh, Cameron has done exceeds any work that I did. So, you know, these newspaper clippings and stuff like that, you have to hunt them out. And um, I just want to say that I think everybody here should uh, give a round of applause. <laughs> But this will go down in the annals of your town's history. Uh, this, this stays. The Memorial Plaque, which I think is a fantastic job uh, in, a, in a vision of uh, Trevor, uh, to do that sort of thing. Something we talked about, we never thought we could do, because in those days the Forest Commission said, no, no, we don't do that, forget it. So we did. Uh, and we went upon with our lives. Trevor had the vision to put that together. Uh, Karen has collated an incredible history, far in excess of anything I could have done. And so there you have it. Uh, and I hope you can go home today uh, feeling comfortable to, that uh, these people are, are on it and remembered. Uh, and I've got to say, that picture of Roy Hall there in, in the, uh, in the in when I first saw that, uh, I didn't think much of it. But I walked in here and it just hit me in the face, you know. There was a young guy from a, uh, a um, Abigail College, I think it was, which is a, a farmer's college. He was an apprentice butcher, working for his father before he signed up. And, uh, yeah, what a shame. Unless you hadn't published your problems, have you at all? No, I decided to go ahead with that uh, for several reasons. Um, one was there's no pleasing everybody, and uh, I did get some rather abusive phone calls as a result. Every every publisher can, can get that. Uh, there's also some ramifications, I guess, uh, from the, as a result of the courts. Uh, an inquiry, uh, and where I spoke to people uh, later on in civilian life, uh, they threatened lawsuits and all that sort of stuff, and I thought, guys, I don't need this. Uh, so I stepped back. I had uh, spoken to Peter Dunn, and the narrative that is in this book was the narrative that I'd, or the narratives, if you like, that I'd sent up to Peter, and I think they cover pretty well what had happened. Uh, beyond that, no. Uh, I am planning to talk to someone. I don't want to try and preempt that, that too much. <laughs> but um, there is a, a writer who uh, may take it on. Um, but in that case, and this is the other thing, I would have been uh, punching above my weight. Uh, when I compared it to this, this chap. Can I mention his name? Yeah, you can do whatever you like. <laughs> yeah. I run it by Michael Beach. Okay? And, and uh, if Michael opts to, to take it on, then, then well and good. The interesting thing, uh, I think, is today that uh, people have just approached me and, and said, well, thanks. Uh, well, no, it wasn't just me. There's a guy out here who sits there and keeps very, very quiet. But if I wanted to wander into the bush uh, doing what we did, uh, I couldn't have had a better companion than uh, Rob Pocock here. Rob's knowledge of the bush, his feel for the terrain, uh, was incredible. We could walk in uh, to an area and you saw what you saw today was open country. What we went through was close. Uh, we could walk in and be gone for an hour or so, and then come out on the road about 100 yards apart from each other. Mm. And we still couldn't figure out how we did it. I reckon he was part dingo. Mm. <laughs> uh, it took a lot of time and, and effort to come in and find these um, 
remains and uh, once we got the feel of it. I remember, for example, where we were out on the um, uh, on the Wirraway site. I had two other guys with me, Roach, I think was there. And uh, I just stepped in this little bit of a clearing and just thinking to myself, what the, what the hell are we doing here? Then I looked down to my right and there was a little bar standing out. Now the one thing you get to do, I suppose, when you're going through a scrub like this is to see what is unusual. This was the bush rail of the uh, Wirraway. At the back towards the tail, there's a piece of tube that sticks out about this side on either, about this wide on either side. And that is where you can actually lift the plane. A man can lift the plane and turn it around. Whatever. And I recognise the, the rail. Man, we, we were on that side. Yeah. So you were on the ground. <laughs> Uh, no, there were quite times when both Rob and I did spend time there alone. But um, if you're familiar with the bush, I think you, you know uh, when you're right and you know when it's time to, to walk back, to go back. So I you know, class myself as a real um, good bushman, a hell of a lot better man than me that have been out there. But uh, I, I uh, spent quite a lot of time just following up leads wherever I could, not really knowing what we would find, but when we did find it, we knew we were uh, virtually on the spot. I was approached uh, some time later to, by the Air Force to see if I would assist with some work up that they were planning on doing up in uh, East Timor as far as uh, finding this sort of stuff. That didn't come to uh, fruition, but could Okay, I think we're done. No? Yeah, can I just ask you, you said that the US Law Commission has on the website. Yes. Would you be afraid oh, to yes. uh, yeah, address okay. so we can read it? Yeah, of course. Uh, it's a bit, an easy one. Uh, it's called Oz at War, one word. O Z A T W A R. And the, uh, the uh, author of that, or the, whatever they call the custodian or whatever, is a fellow called Peter Dunn, who also has an order of Australia for uh, his, his research. He's done comprehensive research here. And it couldn't be in safer hands, quite frankly, because Peter is uh, very meticulous and very good at it. So if you have a look at that, and you will see the uh, boat rider, the vengeance, and the rear away mentioned in separate uh, narratives, uh, or they're covered in uh, a thing called because we took poor old Peter who's up in Queensland uh, in Brisbane. Um, he came down here and uh, jumped at the opportunity to uh, come up with us and we'd show him where these sites were because we knew how keen he was about it. And so he wrote an article called uh, My First Visit to a World War II Crash Site. So if any of you want to get onto Google, have a look at Ozat War, um, and you can either then look at the, the Bowfighter um, Vengeance or the Railway site, or collectively look at Peter's uh, work and I'll give you the, uh, the buttons to push or you, you just put on the, uh, the blue highlight and that'll show you the narrative. And, uh, and that narrative is virtually as written here. I didn't put my name on it, but yeah, that's a bit of my work. So I hope that wasn't severely edited. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, Thank you.